So let's go live right now to Lyndon LaRouche speaking to the nation from his studio in Leesburg, Virginia on the evening of September 18, 2001. Lynn, it's one week after the attacks on the, on the Pentagon and on the World Trade Center. Um, you have been making comments over the whole week uh, about that, starting uh, with the events as they, tra as they were going on uh, last Tuesday. What do you have to say to the American people now? Well, the point is, the first thing is people are frightened, the first consideration. The nature of the events is frightening especially for this generation and most of this population. They are showing signs of great anxiety, of course, most acute in the D.C. area and the New York area. Under these conditions, people tend to become uh, suggestible. They tend to uh, have fantasies, exert bad judgment. Now, the first thing a commander does under conditions of war, and there's certain things about this situation which are analogous to war in real sense. You must have your troops, the fighting troops, uh, not panic-stricken, calm, realistic, uh, not, uh, don't try to pump them up with false confidence, but a realistic view of the situation and a sense that you are effectively in charge. And that's what the American people need now, as opposed to the what CNN, for example, and Fox News have been doing with their television broadcast. Mm -hmm. The worst possible thing you can do to the American people to cause the worst kind of crisis. L look at the situation. First of all, what has happened to the United States is on last Tuesday. It came under, on the 11th, it came under attack by a mysterious force, which I know is some kind of rogue operation inside the security screens of the United States. This did not come from the Middle East, it didn't come from Europe, it didn't come from South America. There may be people who are nationals from other parts of the world who are involved in this. But the operation is very sophisticated, and no one could do an operation like this from outside the United States at present. There's no one who could do what was done here then. So we know it's a very high-level rogue operation inside our own country. Now, that's not the only problem. When something like this happens, Many other things begin to go wrong. People who are crazy begin to do crazy things. People who are frightened and can be set off, shall we say, by these kinds of events will do crazy things. So you have a general insecurity situation inside the country. So you've got to calm the thing down. The president doesn't know who's behind this yet. I think that's a fairly safe thing to say. But we have to approach this uh, from a command standpoint as like a hunter. What a hunter does, as opposed to the bang-bang guy who goes out with a gun and shoots in all directions hoping to see something, a hunter stalks his prey in a very systematic way. What the hunter does is reads the spore and try to read the mind of that species of animal. Identify the species, identify the spore, read the spore, find out what kind of an animal you're up against with an animal. Now, we're trying to define the perpetrators of this uh, crime, not just to punish them, but to prevent them from doing what obviously they intend to do, something similar, worse than they did on the 11th of September. So therefore, you have to have a sense of a government which knows what it's doing in defining who the enemy is, reading the enemy's mind from his spore and from his capabilities, going at the problem in a systematic way and turning to the American people and saying, here's what our situation is. Yes, we have an enemy within. It's a very powerful, very dangerous enemy. We don't know how far he's prepared to go, but we must conclude he's prepared to go further than he did on the, 7th, on the 11th of September. But we're in charge. We're taking the following measures, that kind of a thing. You've got to give the American people a sense, particularly the American people, a sense that you care for them, that you understand their problems, that you're in charge, and you're, being, you're taking responsibility. And you've got to calm them down mm -hmm. with a sense, that kind of approach. That's what I tried to do in the course of the broadcast. I was talking to Jack Stockwell during this broadcast. And Jack and I, in a sense, were talking to each other. 
But we were both aware of the large listening audience on the radio from that station at that time. And we knew that would be picked up and relayed to other parts of the country. And therefore, my job as, for example, a presidential candidate, someone who knows what it is to be president, is to say to the American people what I would say as president and hope that would be echoed by the actual incumbent sitting president in the next phase. And that's what's needed this time. We are no guarantees. I think we can lick the problem. But if the American people go crazy or if they're terrified by what CNN and Fox News and others are doing to them in the mass media, then we are in real trouble. Do you think the president is going to follow your advice? I think there are, there are probably by now there are indications that there are a number of aspects of the institutions of the United States who probably agree with me and probably are thankful for what I did. I certainly know that many governments abroad or leading circles in those governments do agree with me. I think that some of these people who are experts have the ear of the president as it is advisors. I think that they are reporting to him the kinds of things that I would wish them to report to him. There's still a lot of confusion. Still a lot of things are being said by him and by others and things aren't being done that should be done. But I think that to some degree, some of the message is getting through. I just hope enough of the message and I hope in time. Um, on another, another question, there's a, obviously a, a large, at least according to the media, a large buildup for some kind of military uh, operation in Afghanistan as a punishment for Osama bin Laden or, or it, it seems. Um, do you think the United States should go into Afghanistan? No, not at all. Uh, there may be a reason to do something like that, but at this point there is no reason to anticipate going into Afghanistan or any other country at this time. Uh, practical things would be to get the Middle East peace immediately, to end this war which is going on in Israel in the area of Israel, to bring about peace there. We would hope that Sharon would cooperate with us and realize that what he's doing in, not, in avoiding the, the kind of peace process which Oslo set into motion, that he's actually contributing to a great danger to the United States and many other countries at this time. Therefore, we would hope he would come to his senses with other Israeli leaders and work to calm this thing down because that's our, our major danger. Our major problem is inside the United States. There are two things we have to consider. It is not accidental that this uh, attack on us occurred at precisely the time that the ongoing international monetary and financial collapse was reaching a peak point, a point of crisis. And, and things like this happen in times like this. So obviously some very powerful group of people inside our country, perhaps with some cooperation from outside, but essentially inside our country, decided to do the equivalent of a coup d'etat against the United States, which meant uh, methods of terror to make the population malleable, to accept what they're planning to do, and at some point come forward and actually represent a new kind of government of the United States to replace the present government. Mm -hmm. That's their objective. So therefore, one of our things we have to do is we have to preempt this by dealing with a financial and monetary crisis now. For example, right now the airline system of the United States is crashing. Not that the planes are crashing, but the finances are crashing. Well, we can't have that. We cannot allow the essential airline industry, which is a part of our national infrastructure, to collapse. Therefore, the government must step in, not with a bailout of Wall Street, but with a plan to supply credit and reorganization, that is government-protected reorganization of the airline industry, to ensure this thing functions, and to give them a plan which perhaps over a year, 10 years or 20 years, allows the industry to come back to full self-sustaining uh, uh, stability, and that kind of protection. There are other things we must do. So therefore, the first thing is to realize we must act upon the general nature of the world situation, the effects of the international monetary and financial crisis, which is a point of danger, things like the Middle East war, which must be calmed down, a point of danger. We must win the confidence of the American people for measures of this type, and we must act. In that process, we will weaken the potential of the enemy who is now preparing to strike again. And if we make the American people aware of this, then no coup d'etat 
could be successful in the United States. Then the enemy is morally and politically defeated, whatever power he represents. Those, I think, are the immediate objectives. I see. So you, so you, you have talked a lot in the past about a, a Pearl Harbor effect uh, in the population um, as being the only way to get the American population to uh, effectively act to realize the kind of solutions that Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, was able to implement following Pearl Harbor the last time. Um, so you're saying that this, this crisis, which some people have, have also uh, compared to Pearl Harbor, could also have that effect? Well, I, hoped to, I had hoped to avoid anything like a Pearl Harbor effect. My view was that I'd made certain proposals. Numbers of people around the world, including people close to the Vatican, for example, leading Italian politicians, uh, senators, and uh, members of the House of Deputies, and others. People from all over the world had endorsed my proposal for a new Bretton Woods, which means address the present financial crisis by admitting that the system we've had for the past 30 years has failed. Mm -hmm. What Nixon set into motion in August 1971, the so-called floating exchange rate system, measures taken by Carter afterwards, have been the biggest catastrophe the United States has faced economically in the 20th century. It was a mistake. So between 1945 and 19, the middle of the 1960s, despite all the mistakes that were made in that period, we had an economy that worked. Europe recovered from a war and depression. South America survived. Japan was rebuilt. Other parts of the world benefited. Some didn't. We didn't have cooperation with everybody. But some, it worked. The, flo the old system. And so I said, simply, the American people are not prepared yet, nor other nations, to experiment with some newfangled kind of approach. They are prepared to say, this system isn't working. Hey, please, let's go back to the one that did work. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if you would have enough political figures would make that decision and announce it to the American people, you would find a sudden change in the attitude of the American people. Because people like our Americans, they're frightened people. They don't tell the truth. They deny things that frighten them. They pretend that something else is the problem rather than the thing that frightens them most. They will not face up to the idea of a general financial collapse, which threatens their bank, which threatens their employment, which threatens their community. They will not face this reality unless first, as Franklin Roosevelt understood, understood this very clearly, you have to say, we know your problem. We're going to deal with it. At that point, when people have a credible offer of a solution for their problem, they will now admit the problem exists. Under those conditions, if enough American people, leaders, had said to the American people during the year 2000, during the election, presidential election campaign, this is the situation, this is what we have to do about it, this is what we have to be prepared to do, the American people would have listened, or most of them. And the politicians would then have the support of the American people and we would have this thing under control. If you don't deal with a problem like this in a timely fashion, if government mm -hmm. says, as the Gore campaign and the Bush campaign said in the year 2000, we're not going to talk about it. Not a single one of them made a, said a word about the worst financial crisis, the crisis in history, which is coming on down then. Not a word. They're running for president. The biggest thing anyone's going to face as president in the year 2001 is the worst financial crisis in modern history. Not a word, not a whimper. They left the American people exposed psychologically to the impact of something for which the American people were not prepared, psychologically. If you try to run an operation like that, and you don't, you keep postponing. You pretend it's not true. Oh, no, the market will always rebound. Things like that. When it hits, the shock will drive people into a state of anxiety where their behavior becomes uh, unpredictable, highly irrational, and dangerous. And that happened. So now we've come to a Pearl Harbor effect. As I saw in that famous Sunday in December 7th, 1941, as I was walking the streets of New York that morning in Manhattan, and it was a strange atmosphere in the streets. It was Sunday. The streets were largely deserted. I walked into a hotel lobby where I was, had a business appointment, and I found out what was happening. Pearl Harbor had been struck. And during the rest of that day, people were running, looking for the recruiting offices, military recruiting offices, in pan like panic mobs. I want to join up. I want to join up. 
And so a par that was a Pearl Harbor effect which changed the behavior of the American people in one day. And we've come to that kind where we have a Pearl Harbor-like effect, not a good one, yeah. but an effect. And therefore, we have to change now. So therefore, the leaders have to respond to this reality and reassure the American people, not with phony promises, but reassure them in a way that makes the American people ready to face the problem and then work on the solutions. Hmm. Um, you said that uh, the enemy is within. Do you expect further attacks? And if so, I mean, it's hard to, hard to imagine, but do you expect further attacks in, uh, soon? Or will the enemy wait for things to calm down? No. Or the, this, this attack that was done in New York and in Washington was targeted the people of the United States. What do they hit? They hit New York City. New York City is a symbol of the financial power of the United States. That's only a symbol. It's not really the financial power of the world. Mm -hmm. But it's the symbol of that in people's minds. It's the greatest concentration outside of London of the financial center population. They attacked the personnel in the Pentagon, which is the command of the military forces. These were psychological attacks against the U.S. population. There was not an attempt to kill the president. No sign of it. And as I read the mind of the enemy, the enemy had no intention to kill the president at this time. Mm -hmm. Maybe later, yes. Th though the people who said there was a threat to the life of the president were right. Anytime something like this happens, the Secret Service and other agencies have to assume there is a threat to the president and act as if they had actual knowledge of a threat at, under those conditions, even if there's no actual threat known. The very uh, fact of an attack on New York City in that way indicates there is a threat to the President of the United States. You don't do that to the United States without representing a potential threat immediately to the pre life of the President. Because what do you want to do with it? What do you, why do you want to attack the United States? Obviously, you defeat it. How can you defeat it with an attack like that? Well, maybe bring down its government. Attack its centers of government. They weren't at that this time. This time, they were trying to panic the American people. Now, that means that they're not ready to make the coup d'etat yet. That means that they'll be looking for a next operation, which would probably, knowing the mind of the animal, will be different than this operation that just happened. But it will be a larger scale attack on the American population. Then, if the population is sufficiently manual by being terrified by this, then they might go for the actual coup d'etat. But we're looking at a threat of a coup d'etat against the United States government. Now, therefore, I know how these things can be done. We've just been at this counterintelligence for a long time. So, uh, in the, we're playing a mind game against an animal in the forest, an animal whose spore I have read and whose necessary species I know. I do not know the names of the animal. I don't know where they're located. I can guess. Therefore, we're playing a mind game against the enemy, which is this animal, the coup potential, the rogue element inside our security forces with whatever allies it has and, and the accomplices it has. Therefore, we have to conduct our policy not really to find him and neutralize him, but we also have to take measures which will frustrate his ability to achieve the effects for which he aims. Therefore, we have to do, as I say, first of all, you have to calm the population. You have to say what the enemy's nature is. Stop talking about Arab terrorists. This is not our problem. There are problems of that type in the world, but this is not our problem here. Name the names. Name the kind as much as we can. Say what the danger is. Say we're determined to stop it. And say that the enemy he tries to run a coup d'etat the American people will rise up and destroy him if he tries it. Hmm. That's, the first, that's the first thing to be made clear, because we don't know where he is. We don't know where to hunt him out. We don't have his name, but we know what kind of an animal he is, and we know what his game is. Therefore, we maneuver as you do in warfare, where you don't see the enemy's eyes, you know his troops are there, 
and you deal with them accordingly. Okay, well, let, let's get this a little bit clearer, though. I mean, there are people in the United States now who are arguing that, that it's the U.S. government that did it. I mean, people, I've heard arguments going so far as to say that George Bush did it himself. Um, now, you're saying that it's, it's, it's rogue elements inside the government. Oh, we don't know. Yeah, they could be. They're inside the government, probably. But you have Mr. X. See, Mr. X, on the one hand, is a government official or a member of some part of the security establishment. Maybe a retired general officer acting in some other capacity. So you know him by his right name, his ordinary name. But he has another identity as a member of this organization. Also, in these kinds of things, uh, an operation like this has a very tricky command structure. The command structure is designed to be an efficiently centralized command structure, but on a need-to-know basis, so the various elements that are being deployed really don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. We've seen this before. But inside the United States? Inside the United States. We have to look... Pr the danger lies inside the United States. An outside attack on us would be dangerous to anyone, any enemy. We don't have much power left, but we have that kind of power. Nobody better attack the United States from the outside we are vulnerable to an attack delivered by an agency from the inside. Mm -hmm. And that's something I think frightens some people in government who may suspect I'm right on this one. How do you tell the American people they have to look for the danger from the inside? Isn't it convenient to say we're going to go out and hit somebody, particularly when you have idiots like CNN and Fox News clamoring for the United States to go out and run a clash of civilizations to turn the planet into a global religious war, and attacking a billion people? Muslims on this planet, stirring up you know what, not else, they're nuts. And the first thing is to shut these guys up. Don't take away their civil rights, but come out and say, these are clowns. Don't listen to them. Mm -hmm. The President of the United States says, don't listen to CNN, don't listen to Fox News. They're a bunch of, they're a bunch of irresponsible <laughs> clowns lying to you, just trying to drive you crazy. It'd probably be a very good thing for them to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because, um, The, um, okay, what should then, you, you're, you're asking, you've, you've gone through what Americans shouldn't fear. What should your average American do under these, uh, under these circumstances? First of all, is face the truth. Uh, he needs some help. Uh, I found that what we're doing, what I'm doing and my associates are doing and others, is working that people to whom we speak, you know, first thing to do, how do you speak to American people? Speak in a calm voice, even level, calm, relaxed, friend. Uh, let's think about this. Think about what you're saying. Think about what you're being told. Do you really think it's true? Get people from panicking, get them to think. We find it works. You all, you'll have a few people who are crazy already driven crazy by this stuff. But most people will tend to think, if you approach them in the right way. So you, first of all, we have to, I, my associates, and others, have to approach the American people calmly, saying, look, it's a terrible threat. We don't deny it. There's a terrible depression coming down. Don't deny it. But we say we can lick these things. Mm -hmm. We can defeat the enemy. We can control this depression. We can survive this quite nicely. We did it under Roosevelt. We've learned lessons, we can do it again. So we don't need to worry about that. What we need to worry about, can we get ourselves together to get the government to do what it has to do? Hmm. That's what has to be done, essentially. If you've got the American people mobilized behind you on the basis of that kind of voice, that kind of determination, you now have an army, the army of the people of the United States. The army will mobilize as an army to fight the enemy it has. And I think this army will do fairly well. Mm. Mm. Um, in 1995, uh, your magazine, Executive Intelligence Review, uh, put out a special report um, which um, uh, discussed in great detail the British intelligence involvement in all sorts of terrorist activities internationally uh, and domestically. Uh, do you think there's a British involvement uh, in the current operation? Well, yes. I don't, there are probably two sides in Britain on this one, as there are in this country. For example, uh, terrorism, modern terrorism in the present form, 
was unleashed as a mass phenomenon in Europe, the United States, and elsewhere in 1958. Some of the same people who were leaders or key participants in terrorism in 1968, such as, for example, the Basque terrorists in Spain, are, have been continuously functioning as terrorists to the present day, the ETA. ETA yeah. right? They're part of this operation. They were part of the operation. Remember, we had this planned uh, terrorist deployment in Washington, D.C. for the end of September. This was, the, was headed up by an international intelligence figure named Teddy Goldsmith. Teddy Goldsmith is the brother of the deceased Jimmy Goldsmith, who is a key part of Iran-Contra, mm -hmm. uh, what we call Iran-Contra, part of it that created the Afghanzi operation, mm -hmm. which created uh, <laughs> Osama yeah. bin Laden, created him. Uh, so this was a British-American-Israeli operation, essentially, this terrorist operation. And it was used for political effects. It was, in, it was not a bunch of independent terrorists running around organizing terrorist organizations. These things were organized from the top by the so-called secret or special warfare branches of governments or similar kinds of government agencies and powerful agencies, financial and so forth. So part of this was British intelligence. You had an element in the United States. I take the United States that, uh, in the past 25 years. The terrorism <coughs> which created the Afghans was first launched on behalf of the United States by Zbigny Brzezinski, the man who designated uh, Jimmy Carter to be nominated as President of the United States and who became his national security advisor. It was under Brzezinski that the Afghanzi was created mm -hmm. as an Afghan operation against the Soviet system. It was one of, uh, sort of like a Vietnam War operation against the Soviet system. So <coughs> this kind of terrorism is that. That has continued to the present day. In the 1980s, on the name of counterterrorism, operating out of one branch of the National Security Council, you had the, what became known as Iran Contra. This was another level. Now, you had the 1970s terrorism, which was organized out of government agencies in Italy, in France, and so forth. You had the 1980s terrorism which was organized by the same forces, British and the British, Israeli, and U.S. forces were key in this stuff. Mm -hmm. Certain elements of NATO, uh, funny, funny departments of NATO were involved. Today, with this crowd that is now training and directing the operational aspects of the terrorism planted, planned for Washington, D.C. for the end of this month, this crowd is trained by people who are part of the generation of the 68 terrorists, part of the generation of the 1970s terrorists, part of the generation of the 1980s terrorists. So you have a terrorist capability loose on this planet. Hmm. And this, this is known. It can be identified. It can be dealt with. It can be exposed. And by, if you expose it adequately, you can neutralize it. So you're saying that the, the, the enemy that committed this act one week ago um, although U.S.-based, or based partially in the U.S., could be using these elements like bin Laden and well, so not, forth. I think bin Laden is not too important. Uh -huh. he's not, I don't think he's particularly significant for this particular operation. Mm -hmm. But the same people who, as a command group, were operating in things like the terrorism of the 1960s, 70s, 80s, who were involved in Iran-Contra, which is actually a terrorist operation, if you, you want to. Hmm. <laughs> it's yeah. a regular warfare operation. Yeah. The same people are loose, and it is in that command structure that somebody could pull together a group of people who have access to all kinds of resources and know how to do these things. Because this is th the mind that runs this kind of special warfare operation is a special kind of military mind. So you're looking for top-grade military strategic specialists who know how to set up an operation as skillful and technologically polished as this attack on New York and Washington was. No amateur is going to do this. No rough-and-tumble terrorists can do that. They can do certain things. They're part of the auxiliaries of the operation. But they're not the people who can set up the kind of operation we're doing. And we have this element 
The command element is still here. Nobody's exposed it. It's not been caught. It's ready to strike again. And with the behavior of CNN and so forth, it's being given all the encouragement and the security screens of the United States. This did not come from the Middle East. It didn't come from Europe. It didn't come from South America. There may be people who are nationals from other parts of the world who are involved in this. But the operation is very sophisticated, and no one could do an operation like this from outside the United States at present. There's no one who could do what was done here then. So we know it's a very high-level rogue operation inside our own country. Now, that's not the only problem. When something like this happens, many other things begin to go wrong. People who are crazy begin to do crazy things. People who are frightened and can be set off, shall we say, by these kinds of events will do. So let's go live right now to Lyndon LaRouche speaking to the nation from his studio in Leesburg, Virginia on the evening of September 18, 2001. Lynn, it's one week after the attacks on the, on the Pentagon and on the World Trade Center. Um, you have been making comments over the whole week uh, about that, starting uh, with the events as they, tra as they were going on uh, last Tuesday. What do you have to say to the American people now? Well, the point is, the first thing is, people are frightened, the first consideration. The nature of the events is frightening. Uh, not, uh, don't try to pump them up with false confidence, but a realistic view of the situation and a sense that you are effectively in charge. And that's what the American people need now, as opposed to the, uh, what CNN, for example, and Fox News have been doing with their television broadcast. Mm -hmm. The worst possible thing you can do to the American people to cause the worst kind of crisis. L look at the situation. First of all, what has happened to the United States is on last Tuesday. It came under, on the 11th, it came under attack by a mysterious force, which I know is some kind of rogue operation inside the crazy things. So you have a general insecurity situation inside the country. So you've got to calm the thing down. The president doesn't know who's behind this yet. I think that's a fairly safe thing to say. But we have to approach this uh, from a command standpoint as like a hunter. What a hunter does, as opposed to the bang, bang guy who goes out with a gun and shoots in all directions hoping to see something, a hunter stalks his prey in a very systematic way. What the hunter does is reads the spore and try to read the mind of that species of animal. Identify the species, identify the spe spore, read the spore, find out what kind of an animal you're up against, especially for this generation and most of this population. They are showing signs of great anxiety, of course, most acute in the D.C. area and the New York area. Under these conditions, people tend to become uh, suggestible. They tend to uh, have fantasies, exert bad judgment. Now, the first thing a commander does under conditions of war, and there's certain things about this situation which are analogous to war in real sense. You must have your troops, the fighting troops, uh, not panic-stricken, calm, realistic, 